Little Women, Chapter One, A Letter. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth. The four young faces brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, we haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. Each thought of father far away down south where the fighting against the rebels was. Then Meg said, you know the reason mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone and she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. But I don't think the little we would spend would do any good. We've each got a dollar and the army wouldn't be much helped by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from mother or you, but I do want to buy a new novel for myself, said Joe, who was a bookworm. I plan to spend mine on new music, said Beth. I shall get a nice box of drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy. Mother didn't say anything about our money, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Joe. I know I do, teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I am longing to enjoy myself at home, said Meg. You don't have half such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out of the window or cry? It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross and my hands get so stiff. I can't practice piano well at all, said Beth. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy, for you don't have to go to school with rude girls who tease you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and at your father if he isn't rich. Don't you wish we had the money Papa lost when we were little, Joe? Dear me. How happy and good we'd be if we had no worries, said Meg. You said the other day you thought we were a deal happier than the King children, for they were fighting and worrying all the time in spite of their money. So I did, Beth, said Meg. Well, I think we are, for though we do have to work, we make fun for ourselves. True, said Joe, but it's bad to be a girl anyway when I like boys' games and work and manners. I'm dying to go and fight in the war with Papa, and I can only stay home and knit like a pokey old woman. Poor Joe. You must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls, said Beth. The four sisters sat knitting away in the twilight while the December snow fell quietly outside and the fire crackled cheerfully in the room. It was a comfortable old room, though the carpet was faded and the furniture was very plain. For a good picture or two hung on the walls, books filled the shelves, and chrysanthemums and Christmas roses bloomed in the windows. Margaret, or Meg, the eldest of the four, was sixteen and very pretty, with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair, and a sweet mouth. Fifteen-year-old Joe was very tall, thin, and reminded one of a colt, for she never seemed to know what to do with her long arms and legs, which were very much in her way. She had a determined mouth, a comical nose, and sharp gray eyes. Her long, thick hair was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled in a net to be out of her way. She had round shoulders and big hands and feet. Elizabeth, or Beth, as everyone called her, was a rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl of 13, with a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression. She seemed to live in a happy world of her own, only leaving it to meet the few whom she trusted and loved. 
Amy, the youngest, was a regular snow maiden with blue eyes, yellow hair curling on her shoulders, pale and slender. When Mr. March lost his property in trying to help an unfortunate friend, the two oldest girls begged to be allowed to do something towards their own support, at least, believing that they could not begin too early to cultivate energy, industry, and independence, their parents consented. Margaret found a place as nursery governess and felt rich with her small salary. As she said, she was fond of luxury, and her chief trouble was poverty. She found it harder to bear than the others, because she could remember a time when home was beautiful, life full of ease and pleasure, and want of any kind unknown. Joe happened to suit Aunt March, who was lame and needed an active person to wait upon her. Something in Joe's comical face and blunt manners struck the old lady's fancy, and she proposed to take her as a companion. This did not suit Joe at all, but she accepted the place since nothing better appeared, and to everyone's surprise got on remarkably well with her cranky relative. I suspect that Joe's real attraction there was a large library of fine books, which was left to dust in spiders since Uncle March died. Joe remembered the kind old gentleman who used to let her build railroads and bridges with his big dictionaries. The dim, dusty room with the sculpted busts staring down from the tall bookcases, the cozy chairs, the globes, and best of all, the wilderness of books in which she could wander where she liked made the library a place of bliss to her. The moment Aunt March took her nap or was busy with company, Joe hurried to this quiet spot and curling herself up in the easy chair, devoured poetry, romance, history, travels, and pictures. Beth was too bashful to go to school. It had been tried, but she suffered so much that it was given up, and she did her lessons at home with her father. Even when he went away and her mother was called on to devote her skill and energy to soldiers' aid societies, Beth went on by herself and did the best she could. She was a housewifely little creature and helped their servant, Hannah, keep home neat and comfortable never thinking of any reward but to be loved. Long, quiet days she spent, but not lonely or idle, for her little world was peopled with imaginary friends, and she was by nature a busy bee. There were six dolls to be taken up and dressed every morning. Beth had her troubles as well as the others, and not being an angel but a very human little girl, she often wept a little weep, as Joe said because she couldn't take music lessons and have a fine piano. She loved music so dearly, she practiced away patiently at the jingling old piano that wouldn't keep in tune. She sang like a little lark and never was too tired to play for Marmy, mother, and the girls. If anybody had asked Amy what the greatest burden of her life was, she would have answered, my nose. It was not too big nor red, it was only rather flat. No one minded it but herself, and it was doing its best to grow. Amy had a talent for drawing, and was never so happy as when copying flowers, designing fairies, or illustrating stories. Her teachers complained that, instead of doing her math, she covered her slate with animals. She got through her lessons as well as she could. She was a great favorite with her mates, being good-tempered. She could play twelve tunes, crochet, and read French without mispronouncing all of the words. She had a sad way of saying, when Papa was rich, we did so-and-so, which was very touching, and her long words were considered perfectly elegant by the girls. Meg was Amy's confidant and advisor, and by some strange attraction of opposites, Joe was gentle Beth's. To Joe alone did shy Beth tell her thoughts. The two older girls, Meg and Joe, were a great deal to one another, but each took one of the younger into her keeping and watched over her in her own way, playing mother, they called it. The clock struck six, and having swept up the hearth, Beth put a pair of their mother's slippers down to warm. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair, said Joe. 
I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in saying, I'm the man of the family now, now that Papa is away, and I shall buy the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves and then surprise her. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There is so much to do about the play for Christmas night, said Joe. And then they rehearsed this play, which Joe herself had written and which left the girls in high spirits. Glad to find you so merry, my girls said a cheery voice at the door, and the actors turned to welcome a tall, motherly lady. She was not elegantly dressed, but the girls thought the gray cloak and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. Well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do getting the boxes ready to go tomorrow that I didn't come home till now. Has anyone come calling, Beth? How is your cold, Meg? Joe, you look tired to death. Come and kiss me, baby. While asking these questions, Mrs. March got her wet clothes off, her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. The girls flew about trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said, I've got a treat for you after supper. A quick, bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. Joe cried out, A letter! A letter! Three cheers for Father! Yes, a nice long letter. letter. He is well, and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas, and a special message to you girls, said Mrs. March. I think it was so splendid of Father to go as chaplain when he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier, said Meg. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer or a nurse so I could be near him and help him, exclaimed Joe. It must be very unpleasant to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad tasting things and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. When will he come home, Marmy? asked Beth. Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his work as long as he can, and we won't ask him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now, come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire. Mother in the big chair, with Beth at her feet. Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair, and Joe leaning on the back. Father said little of the hardships he suffered. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter, full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches and war news and only at the end did his heart overflow with love give them all my dear love and a kiss tell them i think of them during the day and pray for them at night a year seems very long to wait before i see them but remind them that while we wait we may all work so that these hard days need not be wasted i know they will remember all i said to them that they will be loving children to you will do their duty, fight their enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be, may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Everybody sniffed when they came to that part. Amy hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out, I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he mayn't be disappointed in me. We all will, cried Meg. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but won't any more if I can help it. I'll try and be what he loves to call me, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else, said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. Beth said nothing, but wiped away her tears and began to knit with all her might losing no time in doing her duty. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the beginning, and I'm going to go through each of these one by one. We already did the first two. 
Okay, so there we go, chapter one. So we did this one for Joe, and we did this one for Beth. So now I'm going to go to the third one, which was for Amy. I shall get a nice box of drawing pencils. So I'm going to click and hold and drag all the way across. And then right click copy or control C. And this is Amy. So I'm going to go over to our character analysis and go to Amy. And click on dialog. And enter on the keyboard once. And then I'm going to take my font down to 10. And then control V or right click paste. So now that you've heard the whole thing, you know a little bit more about um, the characters. Jo is a bookworm. She loves to read, which is why she wants a novel for Christmas. Beth is the musician. She plays the piano, which explains why she wants new music. She wants new sheet music so she can learn new songs. Amy is the artist, and she wants drawing pencils so that she can continue with her artwork. After the second page, I can't practice piano at all, said Amy. Said Amy? Said Beth. Maybe I typed that wrong. Let me go back and double check that. I think that should be Beth. That's interesting. Where is that? Now I can't even find it. Hang on a second. Yep, I can't practice piano well at all, said Beth. It is Beth. Okay, let me fix that. That's kind of... Oops, I don't know why that's in. It should be Beth. Okay, there we go. So they're all complaining at this point about how hard their lives are. Control C. I'm going to go to Beth. And I'm going to click on this box and get my cursor right after the last um, quote that we have there and enter. And it should still be, yeah, it'll still be on 10 because it was from before. So that's good. So there's Beth. Now go back to the next one. Rude girls who laugh at your dresses and at your father if he isn't rich. Right click, copy, and this is Amy again, and, oh no, that was Beth, sorry, let me go to Amy, there's Amy, and this is how society sees them, this is what the girls think of Amy, or what she thinks they think of her anyway, oops, let me get this back down to 10, the font 10, and right click, paste. They laugh at her dresses and laugh because her father isn't rich. So they see her as poor. That's how the other girls see her at school. The four sisters sat knitting away in the twilight. So now we have some actions that the four girls are doing. And we don't have a slide for all four girls, but I'm just gonna go up to Meg since she's the oldest, oops, not description, I'm going to go to actions and enter once, take the font down to 10, and then paste, right click paste or control V. So the four sisters are knitting, knitting. doesn't say what they're knitting. Now we get into a description. So here's Meg, she's the oldest. This is a good description of Meg. And we're already on her, so I'll go to description now. Go to the description box. Enter. Take the font down to 10. 
And again, don't worry if you can't keep up with me on this. Try and do some. Um, I'm going a little bit quicker because of the recording. So no worries. You don't have to get them all. Try and get as many as you can right now. I don't want you stressing over it. Okay, so that was our description of Meg. So she's the oldest. She's 16. Then we get a description of Joe. She's 15. Isn't it nice to copy and paste and not have to type all this in? <laughs> okay, so let's go to Joe's slide and description on the description box. And get your cursor up there. Get the cursor. There it is. Now you see it blinking. Enter on the keyboard. Drop the font down to 10. And then paste. Right click paste. That was a long one. 15 year olds, very tall and thin, determined mouth, comical nose, sharp gray eyes. Long thick hair was her one beauty, round shoulders, and big hands and feet. Kind of an interesting description for a girl, isn't it? All right, where's my mouse? Now, Beth. Copy. There we go. And let's go to Beth's slide. And this is a description of Beth. There we go. Enter on the keyboard. Let's drop the font down to 10. And paste our description of Beth. A rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl at 13 with a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression. Okay. And now let's look at our description of Amy, a snow maiden. Copy, and let's go to Amy's slide. And click on description. And get the cursor up there. There we go. Enter on the keyboard once. Drop this down to 10, and then paste. Regular snow maiden with blue eyes and yellow hair. Good. Now, Margaret, Meg, found a place as a nursery governess. So this was her job. She found a job as a nursery governess. What that means is, She's working in a family's home, and she's taking care of the children, um, kind of like a nanny. Think of her like a nanny. That's what we would call it today, but back then they called it a governess. So she was a nanny for a family. So we're going to go back up to Meg, and we're going to put this in the description for uh, Meg. There we go. I've got my cursor here. I'm going to keep, click enter once. It should still be on 10 and paste that in. She's a nursery governess or a nanny. And then we have um, this description of Aunt March. Aunt March was lame. That means that she was elderly and she needed to be cared for. She wasn't able to completely care for herself. So she needed an active person to wait on her, and they think of her as cranky. And so we're going to put this in the description for Aunt March. And Aunt March's slide is down here after Marmy's. Aunt March description. There it goes. Enter on the keyboard. I'm going to drop this down to 10. And then paste. Thank you. Joe happened to suit Aunt March and became her companion. So when you became elderly and you needed to be taken care of, you had a couple of options. If you had a lot of money, if you were rich, you could go to a special, you can go live in a special place where they would take care of you. Not many people did that. There just wasn't enough. Most people just didn't have enough money. Aunt March had a lot of money. 
she had so much money, she didn't have to go to a home. She could have somebody come into her home and take care of hers, kind of like visiting angels. You ever seen those commercials on TV where they have um, home care nurses and their job is to go to different people's homes and they check on them and make sure, that, see if they need anything. I've always seen that commercial on TV. They're called visiting angels. Um, so that's like what Joe did. So while Meg was a nanny for little children, Joe was like a nanny, but for Aunt March, who was elderly and couldn't completely take care of herself. But part of her job, too, was not just to um, help her get food and get around the house, but it was also to read to her and talk with her and just be a friend in the home so that she wasn't there by herself and lonely all day. Um, that's how much money Aunt March had. She had enough money to she didn't have to go to a home. She could actually stay in her own home and pay somebody to be her friend and take care of her, which in this case, it was her niece. So it wasn't um, too crazy, but uh, not everybody could afford to have a companion. So this was Joe's job. So let's go back over to Joe's slide and we'll put this in her description. I'll click on this. Let's see, there it goes. Enter on the keyboard and paste. Became her companion. Beth, being very bashful, stayed at home. She didn't even go to school. So she tried going to school, but she was so shy and every so intimidated by everyone around her that she just stayed home and did her, like, uh, school at home kind of like what you guys are doing right now but she didn't have a computer so her either her parents or her brothers and sister can have any brothers or her older sisters meg or joe would tell her what to do what her studies were uh, so homeschool just like you guys kind of right now hannah is their servant so it's kind of like a live-in maid is a way to think of, of it. They call her their servant, but um, someone like that today would, oops, not Aunt March. Hannah comes right after Aunt March. So we'll put this in description. She was an older lady, but she wasn't lame like Aunt March. She was still able to get around and do things quite well. So instead of living alone, she needed a job too. I believe her husband had passed away. So she worked in another family's home, helping them with um, anything that they needed with the cooking and the cleaning and all that kind of stuff. Someone that might be in this position, maybe she never got married. She doesn't have any children of her own. So this would be a job for her. Um, you could see Meg as a as the nanny or the governess. If she were to continue growing and growing up and not get married and not have a family of her own, she could very well continue being a governess and end up being like what Hannah has done for the March family as a servant or a housekeeper. This is really what it kind of is. Now, let's see. Not selfish. The girls will get Christmas presents for Marmy instead of themselves. So let's hide, highlight that one. They had a dollar, one, they each had one dollar to spend. So let's go back up to Meg. She'll be our, our default um, when it has to do with all four of them. And we'll put it under actions. The girls will get Christmas presents for Marmy instead of themselves. So one whole dollar doesn't sound like a lot, but back then it would buy a lot. Then they have a tradition. They will put on a play on Christmas Day written by Joe. Now remember, they didn't have TV or video games, so they needed things to do for fun. They didn't just, they did work all day, but um, they wanted fun things to do too. So we'll put this on Joe's slide under actions since she's the one that wrote the play. And she would be the director too. 
So she'd be the one telling everybody, you know, where to stand and what to say. There we go. I dropped that down to 10. Now I'll paste it right there. Okay. Marmy had a cheery voice. She was a tall, motherly lady. So now we have a description of Marmy. So let's go find Marmy. That sounds so funny to say that. Marmy. I guess that's where mommy came from. Put this on description. There we go. Enter. Drop the font down to 10. And paste. There we go. Marmy said, well, dearies, how have you gotten on today? I love how they talk. It's easy to understand, but definitely not anything, not like how we talk today. Marmy said, well, dearies, how have you gotten on today? And then she said, come and kiss me, baby. <laughs> I don't think we would, that's what we would say. We would say, come and kiss me, honey. Come here, honey, give me a kiss. How was your day? That's more like what we would say. Honey instead of baby. And we wouldn't say, come and kiss me. We'd say, come and give me a kiss. Come and give me a hug. Oh, I missed you so much. Come here, honey. That's more like what we would say today. Oh, and then Joe is so excited. They got a letter from father. They don't have a telephone, so they're not waiting for him to call. They have to wait for a letter to come in to hear from him. And they would be lucky to get one a week, maybe, if even that often. So let's go back to Joe. And we'll put this in her dialogue. Come on, little computer. There we go. A letter, a letter. Three cheers for father. Father went to war as a chaplain. He was too old to be drafted and not strong enough to be a soldier. So he went to be like a pastor and to help in any way that he could. So if you scroll down, the first blue one is Lori. The second blue one is Father. So we will put this in his description. There it goes. Wait for my cursor. It's taking its time. There it goes. Enter on the keyboard. Let's drop the font down to 10. Oops, one too many. There we go. It was all out, everybody to help in any way they could. Father wrote, give them all my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them during the day and pray for them at night. When I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Now, I didn't um, type in the whole entire paragraph. It was too long. I just took the um, important part from the beginning and from the end. And now you can kind of see after reading the whole thing why he would be so proud of them, all of the work that they're doing. So we'll put this under his dialogue. The two oldest girls. Come on. There it goes. Are working to earn money to help the family. The money that they earn isn't just for themselves. It's for the family. And that's not uncommon today to have kids in high school that are getting jobs and helping their family and giving it to mom and dad to help out with bills and things. And that's what they were doing also. And doing their, their part to have their chores around the house and, and help just help everybody survive a very hard time. Okay, so that was chapter one. 